So this is the OGM uh, weekly call for Thursday. Oh, thanks, Pete. Uh, Thursday, May 19th, 2022. And um, I was just showing some Hergé drawings. Hergé is the Belgian artist who drew Tantan. Uh, here's one of them with a little less shine on it. Um, and he comes from the era when King Leopold was still running Belgium. And there's a book called King Leopold's Ghost that tells a story of Belgium. And it turns out that King Leopold was a freak show, like a, oh God, like a really bad freak show. And he always wanted a colony. It's like the Germans have colonies, the French have colonies. Why can't poor little Belgium have colonies? So for 20 years, he was kind of shopping for a colony. He almost bought or made an offer on Uganda. He was looking at a lake, you know, different things here and there. And then he, and then he realizes, and then, he, then he realizes that nobody really knows um, Africa more than um, five miles from the shore. Like, like the, they know the Nile in Egypt because Egypt, uh, South Africa has been taken over and is like a little nascent Republic, but the rest of Africa is basically a big mystery to everybody. So he hires Stanley of Stanley and Livingston and sends him up the Congo River and says, here, you're my agent now, uh, go do my stuff. And um, Stanley then goes up and signs deals with local kings, not only for resources, but for the free labor to pull out rubber, because rubber is the thing they start to realize is really important. So he basically conquers this whole thing, sets up an elaborate scheme to convince the world that this is a, this is, um, a project to reduce the Arab slave trade. And so Arabs were busy up and down the east coast of Africa, I think mostly, um, uh, selling slaves and, and basically kidnapping people. And so he then, uh, King Leopold II of Belgium, um, has a big, a big conference, a big fancy conference where he invites people, dignitaries in, and they talk about slavery and all that. Meanwhile, he's enslaving the Congo. And uh, the more you farm rubber, the deeper into the forests you have to go to get rubber because the trees tap out. Uh, and the quotas keep going up and nobody's getting paid for this. So at, so at some point he starts cutting people's hands off when they don't meet quota. And there's many a famous picture of, of people inside Congo missing hands because they, did, they missed their rubber quota. Uh, the whole story is horrible. Uh, and the rubber pulled from the Congo is a large reason, a large part of the automobile, automobile craze that was starting then because who needed a lot of rubber? Um, cars did. And there were no, there, there still are no good substitutes for the rubber in the tires of our cars. You know that Ford lost their, the biggest investment Ford ever made was in the rubber plantation in Brazil and it went south and they lost like a billion dollars. This is when a billion dollars actually meant something. Ford Lancia. And um, exactly. There's rubber is subject to um, the same, I don't know if it's in the same family as the Irish pit of famine, but they are subject, rubber is subject to um, uh, parasites and uh, viruses. And there's no, there, there are rubber plantations in Asia and there's, you can be in Brazil one day, you know, walking around a rubber plantation, fly to Asia the next day and nobody checks your shoes to see if you're tracking anything. So, it, and, and without rubber, there is no industrialization. There's no decent fake rubber. So. Yeah. We're, we're very precarious here. Rubber's, rubber's one of those very, very strange things. So uh, I've got King Leopold's ghost under my get mad cannon. If you want to get really pissed off, read these. <laughs> uh, so the underground history of American uh, education, the omnivores dilemma, uh, yeah. life incorporated, copywriting culture, an indigenous people's history of the United States, a people's history of the United States by Howard Zinn. You know, so you wander around here, and it's like, ah, ah. So, so I don't mean to put us in a bad mood for the beginning of our OGM call. Uh, this Just is before a- Before you go there, Jerry, it'll bounce back. Oh, you think? Okay, good. <laughs> you think we can recover? Nice to see you, Neil. Um, and uh, so how is everybody? And what would we like to talk, to talk about? Uh, just letting you know, I haven't got long today. Um, the I was ready an hour early. I uh, got the timing wrong, and dinner's shortly going to be served. So I'll I'll hang around and see what you guys want to talk about, and I'll just say hi. I just want to drop in and say, love you all. Just haven't been around much. Thank you. Good to see really you, Neil. Seeing you. Yeah. yeah. Um, topics that are in people's hearts. I would like if Doug is up for it. Um, he 
sent out a proposal, a plan, you know, a draconian plan a week or so ago to the OGM list. I'd love to see if people want to chew on that for a little bit. Sounds good. Doug, Doug you, you, you want to kind of reframe that for us? And... <laughs> I have been so busy since then that I've forgotten what the content of that particular <laughs> was. Um, the, the but I've got new been. ones. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, certainly, uh, well, uh, Ken, can you remember a part of it? It'll bring oh, it back, back I have to, to I have to go look at my email. I've, I've also, I've, I've read so many things since then that it's, it's yeah. kind of floating in my yeah. brain. But, so uh, uh, I can say sort of what's on my mind at the moment, please. which is uh, given that the temperature is going to keep going up, at some point, people are going to respond. Uh, for example, I'm most concerned about people leaving their jobs and poking holes in the infrastructure. Uh, so uh, is that a real issue or am I kind of in some kind of negative romantic fantasy about that? Why are you worried about people leaving their jobs? Because if they happen to be, for example, a truck driver bringing food to the Safeway and the food doesn't get there, or if they happen to be maintenance people on the grid and they don't show up, uh, or an operator in a nuclear power plant and don't show up. So you're worried about essential jobs to maintain basically continuity of, ser of essential services. Yes. Essential workers leaving, because we're in the middle of a great resignation. And if you're hoping people don't leave their jobs, this is the wrong moment to have that wish because a whole lot of people had a pandemic to sit down and go, damn, I don't really like this job or, or this job is nasty and I'm not getting paid enough or any, any number of kinds of things. And it's not elegant, but there's kind of a reshuffling of who works where and who wants to do what. So that's, that's just in the air right now. Right. So let me add to it another dimension. Yeah. I was part of a, a conference of economists yesterday. Uh, and there was to be a proposal of a major effort on dealing with climate change. And I was kind of interested, gee, what's it going to be? Well, it turned out the proposal was that if we shift from a 40 hour to a 30 hour week, people will be working less and so it will produce less CO2. There was no awareness of, for example, the anthropology of poor people who would take the opportunity if they had 30 hour a week jobs to work two jobs uh, and things like that. I mean, it's a total lack of imagination as to the consequences outside of a differential equation, which compares the flow of one thing with another. I was pretty shocked by it, even though I've been around that environment for a lot of, a long time. Yeah. Just um, amazing to me. There's, there's also a general force, and I have no numbers on this. I'd love to see the numbers uh, to drive people below 30 hours a week anyway, because above 30 hours a week, corporations have to give them benefits. So why don't we make you just part time so you have no, uh, so you are randomly called in on shifts. There's no predictability, but you're not making enough to make a living and you're not making enough to qualify for benefits. That, that's been happening too. And my guess is that this little group on the screen, none of us could work 30 hours a week. We just could not cut our activity back to that level. Uh, but that's because we don't drive a truck a, a long distance or whatever else. We're busy thinking about what we're doing and making calls and doing whatever. We're, we're in uh -huh. a strange, strange netherworld where it's hard to turn off. Um, Gil? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and, and, and none of us are doing things that are mission critical to the economy and the world's functioning on a day-to-day -day basis. Right. So that, um, you know, why 30 hour a week when I go all the way to universal basic income? Take, Which, people, off the, <clears throat> take people off the job standard. No, then, poor people don't, then poor people don't have to work two or three jobs. Right. So I don't think UBI means no work week, which is an interesting implication. Uh, Neil? Just picking up on Doug's first point, um, people are going to leave. Uh, there's a heat wave in, in Spain at the moment, and that's heading our direction through into Europe. Um, India was at 60 degrees ground temperature recently. People cannot work in that temperature, full stop. So any economy that's based on uh, labor uh, isn't going to work, full stop. 
the question then becomes who else has chosen to leave because of climate grief, because of COVID, because of recognition that the job is meaningless. So this is a re-evaluation of our values and whether I want to die today digging a hole for a rich person uh, to repair this road or whatever. So there will be infrastructure collapse and there will be other people that are choosing for ideological reasons whether or not they want to go to work or not because my best time spent now is with my family or creating a garden or doing something that might be more meaningful given this is happening. And so at that level, that's uh, one, one aspect. But the second aspect that Doug referred to was he was shocked that they didn't go deep enough because of the questions and the assumptions. And again, nobody is having these courageous conversations about what collapse actually means. Um, the food security uh, process here in this place is based, based around in, in Leuven in Belgium, has had a broad stakeholder uh, representation, but has become more of a talk fest about how to provide food justice, which is important, but not how are we, a, a region that's about to go into a drought, going to survive with a, with a population with increasing climate uncertainty and no water in the soil. And so there is no recognition of survival. It's how do we redistribute excess? And that's still the assumption of the extractive economy, business as usual, horizon one, which is we'll just bounce back, we'll bring back tourism, we'll bring back whatever. Look at uh, Sri Lanka right now. Look at Ukraine. Look at the impact on food security in Africa uh, and throughout the, the prices that are rise, rising. These are impacts that are happening right now. And what Doug's touching on is the tip of that iceberg, which is that the people that think they're doing it have no systemic clue, no collapse awareness or zero collapse acceptance and are not actually doing anything meaningful for design for a future that we might actually have some chance of survival. And in the meantime, people are concerned about the near-term effects of inflation, for example, uh, and how to mitigate inflation through whatever means possible, uh, despite the fact there's a lot of forces loose in the world that are going to head toward probably more inflation, as you just described. But, but uh, yeah, a and just there's a perverse cycle where more inflation probably means Democrats won't be reelected in the US, uh, which means the spiral is going to accelerate. I'm reading a lot of things into that logic, but 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 it's kind of there. Um, so if we go back to Doug's proposal, because I I think it's I'm already feeling like oh god we're into the problems now, you know, right. <laughs> and I really like Doug's proposal because it it actually says here's something we can do, and I I posted it up in the chat here. Um, let me go back here. Um, Thanks. I was just going to ask you to do that. Yeah, we we work to discover people inside of several major corporations at middle management level, hence below the rider. That already know that they already know that the climate requires serious responses and they're getting it. We would get to them. Well, hold on, this is too small for me to see. We get them to network with friends and colleagues in several other corporations. I think five would be sufficient. And we think of three people in each corporation giving a total of 15 that think the same way. They would work together to clarify their position, which would have to do with the need for draconian measures of scale and the draconian problems of scale. When they feel confident, they go to the CEOs and the boards of their corporations and ask if they could join the group and hold press conferences. So this is, it, it feels like it's a good, decent, adjacent start it's not it doesn't require us to do anything huge we can we can start where we are with with people that we know what do people think about Doug's proposal there is what i'm curious about it, it goes back to mary catherine basin's statement that a small group can change the world and the thing is how to find a small group that has the leverage and uh, in my consulting i often came across groups of middle managers who understood the problem of their organization but weren't doing anything about it and it never occurred to them to manage upwards in the organization. Uh, so I did a number of experiments of getting small middle level managers to in fact do that. Uh, and it's exhilarating for them because it's empowering. And I think that it has the kind of leverage that's possible. Uh, this week I thought of another model like this, which is if we took, uh, well, it comes from an experience, an experience in a small town where I was living for a while, where the town was going broke. And a group of us were meeting anyway for coffee once a week. We said, what can we do? 
we said, let's go to the city council and offer to help. Uh, so we did that. We went, got it on the agenda, went to a meeting uh, and said, we came here to help. And the mayor said, nobody ever comes here to help. They just come here to make demands. And it turned out then they passed over to this informal group, things like doing interviews for new employees and things that took them time that we could do that was very helpful. So I think if we took this group here and went to some leverage point and said, we're here to help. We know you are in terrible trouble and you can't get out of the rut that you're in. Uh, so let's try and do something. Uh, be fun to do. Um, I like the disaggregation of what needs to be done a lot in the sense of, hey, we need to, you know, we need to vet candidates and figure stuff out. Could you do some of that? And there's probably millions of things like that that can be distributed or done. You're making me also realize that we've handed off to large institutions work that in many cases, well, that, that used to be done by communities, by, by people in different ways, or work that just didn't exist. Um, and there's a problem with really large institutions and there's a problem with changing really large institutions. And a piece of what your initiative sounds like it wants to do is create a social network of trust with initiatives in order to catalyze change across large institutions. So what is, what is a small crew we can, we can help put in motion at a bunch of institutions that will then catalyze change throughout and, and I think we would then need to figure out what are the levers we can offer each of them uh, to learn how to create change across their institutions. Go ahead, Neil. So yeah, I was sorry going to, to, to sorry, to, sorry to, oh, sorry, go on, Doug. Uh, to uh, uh, give another summary of, of what Ken picked up from what I had proposed. The idea is simple. If you have a small group of middle-level managers that can work together in several organizations, and they work together across organizations and go to the CEOs of their organizations and say, we need to talk to you. I think they would get a hearing. Doug, would we, would we um, initiate this around a particular focus like climate or societal collapse or leave it for the groups to figure out where their focus is? Well, that's, um, I assume that climate change is the key issue. There are a lot of secondary ones that are really important, like soil, mm -hmm. fishing. Um, well, but I think that the, the issue would be climate change. Mm -hmm. It's the inexorable treadmill we're on we've got to get off of if we possibly can. Um, Neil, then me. There's a lot of resistance from business as usual to anything that starts with collapse or climate change. Um, That's what I was about to say. However, however, we have some inroads. And in fact, what sort of some of the work that we're trying to do here in Belgium is enlisting people that we know like the way we think and building trust through them in their organization so that we can take it deeper. But we're probably going to need some sort of Trojan horse strategy. So initially, we ha have presented to them on the Three Horizons model to say, the three, all three horizons are present simultaneously in the present. Uh, the most prevalent one is horizon one, business as usual. Uh, we need that and you have to respect that because it keeps the lights on. And we've got horizon three, which is pockets of the future already present in the present. They're struggling, have no resources, can't be supported because they're too far out there. And then horizon two is the horizon which is bridging between those two. Horizon two negative looks back to horizon one and says, how do we become the next horizon one? Horizon two positive looks forward to horizon three saying, how can we create transformative change? And when you come in with that sort of presentation, it gives them a broader framework for how to handle clients or differences across perspectives of how we move forward. We then hit them with a challenge, which is by the way, the three horizons model isn't going to work unless you collapse aware because nothing we do now is of any value unless it's actually preparing for collapse. And that's a bombshell. But then some of them took that as a personal, that's just their view. So they haven't actually, hasn't actually sunk yet, but as it starts to sink, and I think this is part of the point, will people keep showing up for work? No, they will not show up for work if they've got a better option or if the option of going to work is no longer viable. And so we have to carefully frame 
uh, how we uh, build this because the identity, I see the government authority there, the identity of the individuals, the identity of the CEOs, the identity of the institutions is tied up in doing business as usual and in thinking they're doing it and being paid to continue to do that. So we have to find ways of actually enabling those that have the, uh, the inside running and understanding of how their organisations work, middle managers and so on, who have sufficient trust with their boards and their organisations to be able to bring a proposal to the table. And I believe it has to come from outside the institution that, you know, as Doug is suggesting, there's a critical mass of people that are starting to form to do this thing, which is more innovative than what we're doing. And we have an opportunity to be at the table. If we don't, we're going to miss out. So you're playing literally on the psychology of fear of missing out at the same time as providing them with a towards model. And we're playing on that basis, trying to bring our collapse awareness, collapse acceptance methodology, which once accepted will redirect all resources. That's the point here. It's not about changing the institution. It's actually about redirecting all resources because they're going the wrong direction faster. I'll finish on that, thanks. And thanks. well done, Doug. Thanks, Sam. Uh, Aaron? Uh, yeah. I was just having a talk with uh, Perspectivity. They actually organized um, a process by which they determined uh, how to deal with the nature issue right now in Holland on a national level, and they set out plans. And this organization is uh, focused on dealing with complexity. And there's this organizations like Rios Partners uh, and others that really deal with multi-stakeholder processes. Uh, and these are the kind of people that know how to kind of make this happen. And one of the elements I think in being able to face all of this is the psychology of denial. Denial costs way less effort than having to face all of this. And it's not, um, I was just actually writing a post. It's a bit weird to say it, but I think it makes sense. So it serves. Um, it, I posted uh, a um, post on uh, denial in the Tantra world. Right now in the Tantra world, a lot of abuse is coming up. And then people who abuse, who are the perpetrators, often deny what they're doing. And then a, lot, a huge circle around them creates this kind of uh, justification and trying to see, yeah, they weren't really hurting someone. And there's a lot of stories there. But on a climate level, it's so much more, there's like, there's like a condensed block of denial uh, dynamics somehow. And I can hear through one of the things that yeah, fear of missing out, that, that seems to be like a, a way of doing that. But it, we, I think we need a bit more clarity on the denial and also more processes of dealing with it. Like um, Joanna Macy, she's actually facing that she's really looking at how do we look at collapse and how do you embrace that? What if I, whatever I do, it will never be enough is one of the questions she asks. And all of this psychology and how to deal with it, we need to figure out how that works in our facilitation and in meeting groups also within ourselves, because I think we all carry that. It's me personally, I have a lot of trouble with dealing with the existential level of this a threat that everything is gone, maybe going to disappear. So then what can we do as groups also to support each other, to be with those feelings and to process them better and to, to give some time also to listen to, oh, wow, I feel so much despair looking at this new news article about the da, 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 da. And we do that kind of, but I think we need to do more of it to be able to be facilitators and really be aware of those processes. Um, Eric, I really like what you just said. I will try to mirror two parts of it that I think I heard. One is, hey, there's a bunch of people like uh, Rios and others who figured out a bunch of really clever things here. Why don't we tap, knock on their door and see how we can use their wisdom? And just broadly, uh, let's figure out who's who's solving this well uh, and go go tap their what they've learned so that we don't work against ourselves, so that we don't do the wrong, you know, et cetera. Uh, and then the second thing is, I, and I'm, I may be projecting onto what you said, um, it's really important that people coming in who want to help have a menu of ways to help because 
the, the notion of climate change uh, is often like just too big and too scary. It's a hyper object or it's a political turnoff or whatever. How can we create lots of different avenues to come in to help make the change happen? Yes, no? Yes. Yes. And to, to fully and deeply understand the psychology that goes on all the different levels of that psychology, not on a rational level, but really on a visceral level as well so that we can become more aware of how things really properly move. This is a tricky thing to understand because I really look a lot at process and at pedagogy and how, when does change actually happens? If you go down in, into a group, a meeting with a CEO or a government leader, you need to create an agreement. Okay, now we're going into a process and I will be able to call you 10 times and this is this agreement might be on paper or you have some kind of clarity this will happen and you need to understand the, the, the kind of process that needs to happen before they really come to movement and then they, they don't fall back into business as usual. A big corporation like Unilever, they've been talking about a local farming for a huge amount of time already. How come it doesn't work? I think because there is there's these layers of coming back again and not all the layers are addressed or I, I, there's fuzziness there and that needs to be more clear. Yeah. Thanks, Eric. Uh, interesting stuff. Uh, Pete and Hank. Um, thanks. Uh, and I, I really like what you said, Eric. Um, I also really like what Ken said uh, at least twice. Um, instead of thinking, let's just start doing something let's let's talk about a plan for doing something um and i i guess um i guess i wanted to relate kind of my personal experience over the past few months or the past year probably the past year or two maybe um where even though i love learning about things um and i and i especially love learning about systems um and all the systems that are going well and going wrong um, and the way that they're interleaved or hyper systems and all that stuff is like super amazingly interesting for me. And if I could kind of hit pause on everything falling apart, I would, I would just have a, a ball living my life, just learning about stuff and then worrying about, you know, the systems that were failing and, and worrying and trying to teach people about what they should do about the systems that were failing or what systems they, they are in that are being successful, et cetera, et cetera. Right. I could, I could really easily um, go down a spiral of navel gazing forever. And I would actually pretty much enjoy that. And in our culture, we have inherited um, a couple of really interesting things that make it difficult for us to act. Uh, one of them is learned helplessness. Um, we've been taught by our culture not to think and not to do, and especially not to cooperate with each other. Um, I, I believe that's largely a process of our educational system, our industrial age educational system, uh, which was preparing us to be cogs in, in factories and sit there sewing shirts or, or you know, pounding on a small part of a car or something for you know, uh, 60 hours a week. And you're supposed to do one small thing and do it well and not think about anything else, right? Um, and you don't want, especially you don't want people to be working together because that means that the people in power end up, you know, with this revolt instead of a bunch of people just sewing shirts or whatever. So we've got this learned helplessness, helplessness that's one thing. Um, the way our, our productivity and our consumption cycle goes, it's really important. It has become really important or it's fun or something. I, I actually haven't really haven't thought about this very much, I guess, but it's really we, we spent a lot of time just being entertained and making sure that we're entertained um, either because you're watching Fox News and you're scared to death all the time or uh, because you're watching escapist fantasies all the time and uh, you're happy or whatever, right? We spend a lot of our time in a mindset of not going, hmm, today I feel like doing something. That's not a thing that happens as much as it could or should, right? Uh, we fall into, I want to be scared. I want to be, I want to be anesthetized. I want to be happy, whatever. And I'm just going to go to my happy place in front of the TV and just sit there and, and be happy, right? Um, so 
you know, there's so much information, so much exciting stuff to do. There's uh, this learned helplessness. There's the entertain entertainment economy and psychology that we've inherited from our culture for, you know, interesting reasons, but not important for this discussion. The really cool thing is when you sit down and you go, you know, there's a gift I have. Um, and it turns out I have a, a meta gift, which took me a while to kind of kind of figure out. Um, I want to help uh, soil health. I want to help social justice. I want to help climate change, uh, mitigating climate change, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, even something really interesting that Eric just mentioned, I would love to help on understanding the deep psychology of where we are and what we're doing, right? Um, that's not my gift. Um, and even though it would be exciting and wonderful and fun for me to do that, uh, it's not my gift. My gift is helping people use their gifts. So, um, and this is not everybody's gift. This just happens to be mine. And it took me a long time to figure it out. Um, but uh, when I am super happy and concentrating and feel good about myself, this, you know, the, the proprioception I get that I'm happy is when I'm, I'm finding somebody who's got a problem and a great idea or a crazy idea or whatever, an idea that they're super passionate about, I can help them find out more about that idea, help find other people to help them and, and so on and so forth. So I think it's not a rationalization for me to say that I'm helping with climate change and soil health and social justice and, and equity and economy and all that kind of stuff by teaching people how, the, how they can pick their goal and do more of it, right? Um, so that's my mission. And, um, and I've learned a couple other things uh, that were hard lessons. Um, and thank you, Pandemic, for um, being a nasty taskmaster. Um, but uh, one of them is, is self-care. Um, uh, it, it became really obvious that you had to be really careful managing the psychology of being a shut-in um, two years ago, and we've kind of given up on that, and then there's a whole another story there, but um, making sure that uh, you take time for yourself, making sure that along with doing something productive and, and forward motion on your gift, you also need to like take time to reflect and digest and be with your family and work with other people. And uh, for me, it's walking on the beach with my wife and my dog. Um, you need to make sure that you're taking care of yourself so that you can do the work that's, you know, rolling up towards the, the global, you know, goal of making a better world for everybody. Um, uh, and, and part of that self-care is really noticing when you get into that loop of, of reflecting on how wrong things are. And, and you know, so I, I look at our pundits, uh, each, each and every one of you, right? Doug or Stacy or Ken or Neil or John or Eric. And it's like, oh my God, I wish I could help them with their, I, I wish I could be doing the thing that they do. You know, Eric was so articulate about uh, the psychology of, of facing problems and the deep psychology around that. And then the psychology is, uh, it's like, I would love to be working on that because learning stuff is where, you know, I, one of my joys, but I also have to kind of pull back because it's like I could be working on Eric's stuff, I could be working on Stacy's stuff, I could be working on Neil's stuff, I, in, on the content of it rather than helping them do it um, at a meta level. Um, I, you know, and you get into this this paral paralysis of choice. You know, there's so many things that I could be helping on. Um, I, so the the answer, I guess, kind of the the, the summary is find your gift and work the hell out of it for you know 60 percent of your time and then make sure that the other 40 percent of the time you're taking care of yourself and your situation in your family and in your community so that you can be working hard the the other 60 percent of the time thanks okay um neil you have to boogie soon so i will um go to you first then hank then doug yeah, thanks. First, I just want to thank Pete for that. Pete, you've reached out to offer me assistance, but I wasn't ready to receive it at that time. So thank you for that. I just wanted to second what you said, uh, finding your inner calling in global context, 
and this is the the challenge and and putting a little plug in for the work we're trying to do with courageous conversations it's an inner and an outer journey which is coming back to i think what eric was saying before the inner development but also the recognition of where people are at um, and and holding safe enough space for them wherever they're at in their journey not making them be at a particular point at a particular time and not making it a safe space where you can ignore the realities which are facing us in the face and so how do we hold that safe my partner Anne is a psychologist so we've got the psychological background we have the understanding of the developmental processes we have the facilitator david in australia with the facilitation how do we hold a safe enough space to have real conversations about real issues and enable that to hit the ground and the, the connection back to the uh, event I mentioned recently, when we dug into what were their views of the future, most of them sitting in this organization didn't want to be doing the work they were doing, they want to be creating food forests. But when they put the idea of food forest uh, consortium up the line to their manager, their manager said, no, we don't do that. And they said, well, we've got all these latent skills that nobody's actually explored yet. Um, and I, I've done this course, and I've done this course, but they're not ready for it. So how do we actually show them there is a market for what their heart desires that actually aligns with global intent, which is getting a little bit close to icky guy, right? And to use the gifts of individuals, collectives, corporations, organizations to redirect their energies and their attention to things that might actually make a fucking difference rather than doing the wrong things right and being <laughs> paid very well for it. And that's where they're at right now. But unfortunately, and this is the other psychological problem, the threat is to those who stick their hands up internally, because if they move at the wrong time, then they just look that little bit crazier than the others, and they don't get the position back on the board, so therefore they have no influence any further, and that's what's you know, some of the dynamics that are going on there as well. So this is a very, very delicate dance with the system based on the best objective information you can bring, the best reflective processes you can bring, the best interpretive meaning-making, sense-making mechanisms that you can bring, and then assisting them to get to a decisional outcome on, so now what am I going to do with this one precious wild life, in the words of Mary Oliver, wild and precious life. So thank you so much for hearing me for my brief drop-in once every six months to say, oh, I'm still here with the rage and the love. Um, and you know, I've got to go shortly, but I'll, I'll hang around until I get the signal and I'll keep my mouth shut from now on. Thanks. Um, thanks, Neil, very much. Hank? Get ready to talk. Okay. Uh, I think this is a terrific conversation. Uh, I'd like to thank lots of different people. So I'll start by thanking Ken for bringing it up again, because last time I was here was two weeks ago, and we talked about it for about uh, 20 minutes and then dropped it. Uh, and I think Eric and, and, uh, and uh, uh, Neil and uh, Pete just said terrific things, really good. So let me, let me try to be, uh, a little bit of an advocate of the devil, uh, uh, throwing uh, sour cream on uh, on the blinis and, and like that. So uh, there are different ways to change organizations. There's uh, bottom up, uh, middle out, uh, top down. Uh, so uh, middle out, that's what Rio's partners, and, and I know those people, uh, and I know other groups like that. that. That's what they're doing, and they're doing it a step at a time in, in, a, in, uh, in uh, what we used to call the third world countries. I guess that's politically incorrect these days. They're, do, they're doing it not in the powerful countries. They're making a big difference in the lives of thousands and ten thousands of people. There's also bottom up. Uh, and uh, I used to really believe in both bottom up and top down and middle out, but there's, there's a very interesting Dutch book by, by a Dutch uh, left wing, uh, uh, editor of Dutch left wing uh, newspaper, and it's called The Better Environment Doesn't Begin By You. Uh, and in fact, the argument in the book is that even if you got 30 or 50 or 100 million people in the world using lead lamps and bicycles uh, and, and eating vegetarian food, things have gone so far, it 
really doesn't make that much of a difference. Uh, so there's really only, as far as I can see it, one approach that can make a big difference fast. And when I say fast, we're in this UN uh, decade of doing, and we spent a couple of uh, uh, years already not doing anything but talking. So if you really want to do something in the next eight years, what are we going to do? Yes, I totally agree. There's a lot of denial in the world. There's a crisis of imagination, as uh, Amitav Ghosh uh, has been calling it. The problems are too big. They're too scary. There's learned helplessness. We're uh, we're uh, hypnotized uh, to look for happiness in entertainment. Uh, people are, are, who've ever looked up are, are scared to look up again. People are being paid to do business as usual. Uh, there's just plain fear every place. And to paraphrase one of those, uh, one of those management jokes. I'm not sure exactly where it came from, but I think you'll all recognize it. The 10 most frightening words in the English language are, we're from the government and we are here to help. So, okay, we're from OGM and we are here to help. We're from Rio's uh, partners and we are here to help. My God, uh, Antonio Guterres is, is on the television twice a week. Uh, from from the chair of the United Nations, and he says, "I'm here to help," but nobody wants to, say, to admit they need help. I mean, that's it's tough, tough, tough to say that you're in a problem and you can't figure it out when you need help. Okay, that's my advocate of the devil uh, story, and let me take you again to something top down, which I brought up two weeks ago when we talked about this before. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with Doug's middle out plan, but I'd like you to consider again the top down. 200 people in the world in interlocking directorships, heads of major religions, uh, uh, politicians, opinion leaders, we could probably all name them in the next 25 minutes if we wanted to write the names of 200 people who make all the big decisions that move the world. And we know who they are. And if we're going to look at the deep psychology, we should look at the deep psychology of those people. Because if those people change their tune and start doing things differently, lots and lots of the millions and millions of others will follow. And let's just say of those 200 people, uh, 50 of them are really evil bastards and are doing it because they don't give a damn about the rest of the world. And the other 150, we give them the benefit of the doubt and we say they're scared, they're frightened, they're being paid to do something else, uh, they're mortgaged, they're... and we get a number of them and they all know each other and we get a number of them to change their tune, to get a new narrative. And the new narrative, although I'm not really sure uh, if that cuts, cuts, uh, cuts the knot at the moment, but my best guess at the moment is the new narrative is you 150 or you 200 people will go down in history as the 200 people who saved the world. And if, you don't save the world, there won't be any history. But if you do save the world, if you do change the way we're using fossil fuels, energy, extractive economies, you can get a statue from your children or grandchildren, but there won't be any statues from any children or grandchildren if you keep on doing the things that you're doing. Bit of a somber message perhaps, but put it out there. Um, thanks, Hank, that was a whole, basket full of ideas and I have a whole series of reactions to what you said. I know uh, one of them is you just described kind of Klaus Schwab's motivation for WEF, for Davos. He wanted to bring the most powerful 200 people into rooms to go sort out the world's problems and it doesn't appear to actually work. Um, although I don't want to say that that wouldn't work. 
But one idea that occurs to me is, what if we had a very public hall of fame and hall of shame? And what if we said to the people in the hall of shame, the leaders of the companies that are fucking up the world, you have an opportunity to climb across into the hall of fame and, and make these things quite visible uh, and give out prize like the Ig Nobel prize or whatever else. There's a whole bunch of like negative prizes, right? Uh, there was a congressman who used to give out the Golden Fleece Award for the contractor who had charged the most for some stupid part uh, uh, for the US government. Uh, there, there's a way to draw attention to negative behavior, but without giving people an option to adopt positive behavior, I don't see how that actually works out. Um, the people holding up their hands just changed dramatically. Let's go, Doug, Stacy, Eric. Okay, I've got three points and somewhat controversial. The first is, from my experience, people at the top are not picked because they are leaders. They are picked because they are maintainers. They are picked because they are the least likely to shake up the system of all the people that are available. That's a totally different view. Uh, I don't think those people can be mobilized to do anything because they don't have any imagination. They were picked because they don't. That's why you've got to go down into the organization. And that's going to be my uh, second point. Uh, I believe that the awareness of the issue is huge. Uh, in my community, where I get to talk to carpenters, farmers, uh, vineyard owners, and managers, they all know, have a pretty solid picture of what's going on with climate. Where they're stuck is not in denial, but in inability to see that there's anything worth doing. And that's because the things that are worth doing are so severe, nobody wants to go there yet. Um, my second uh, point is going to be that um, society is held together by the glue of relationships. As we take on managing our little projects to help things out, we are creating more glue it actually makes it harder to change society the more glue there is. I don't know what to do about that. But certainly if you talk to somebody, for example, who just got a grant for a few million dollars to do a scientific work for the next three years, they don't want to talk about climate change until the three years is over. They want to maintain their contracts and relationships as long as they possibly can, even though they are critically aware of the difficulties of the problems. So those are my thoughts. Thanks, Doug. Your comment about the glue of relationships maybe causing less flexibility for change is puzzling to me. Um, and maybe we mean different things by relationships, like who doesn't want to lose a juicy contract and whatever else that, that keeps them in place. But also the, the, the glue, the ligature, the commitments of relationships, the bonds are, are what cause rapid change in moments where things have to happen. I mean, um, it's really interesting. Like without those bonds, really deep important change doesn't happen because you don't think you're gonna be held or kept or anything after the, the big change. So it's really complicated. Um, uh, and uh, let's go Stacy. but uh, Jordan, you were in the queue and you dropped out. Did you wanna jump in or? Uh, well Whenever the right, whenever the right time is, brother. Okay, let's go, Stacy. Then you, then Eric, which I think sort of reconstitutes where you might have been. So, um, go ahead, Stacy. So, I'm a little bit comforted to hear, not just in this call but other calls, a more willingness to be in a state of discomfort or in uncomfortable situations. What brings the most of that, though, is when we look at ourselves. And I'm still skeptical of how willing people are. But since this started with Doug's plan, I want to bring up that when he first suggested it, I spoke on the email, the OGM mailing list. I spoke in the Lionsburg Town Square. And the ask was really, really simple. Just come up with a list of names. We use the stone soup analogy. Just throw in a name. You don't have to be all in with Doug's plan help out a little by throwing in a name. Nobody seemed to be willing to do that. And I'm not just talking about in this case, 
Some of you know Peter Jones from Ecology of Systems Thinkers. Um, he continued on with Michael Josefowitz's work, working with people in Africa on printernet. Four days ago, he put out a plea because one of the people that Michael had been mentoring needed a cell phone. Four days ago, they needed to find somebody from the UK that could donate a cell phone. And in the thousands of people that we must be friends with, I don't think he's gotten that cell phone yet. So I just want to talk about the little things we could do and the fact that we're not. And with that, I'm complete. But this is one of the difficult conversations that I think are important to have. Thanks, Stacey. Um, and there is, Pete talked earlier about just talking and how exciting talking is and talking is so cool and we could just keep talking. Um, and the doing is actually more better and more interesting. So how do we get into some more doing? Uh, Jordan, then uh, Eric and Pete. Uh, it's a great segue. Yeah, I was just, as Doug was saying, you know, small group of people could change the world and we we're looking for 15 middle managers. I was looking around the 15 boxes on this call and um, then thinking about the extended circles of networks. And we have at least, you know, a couple hundred people in our little close knit network of networks. And so I was, I was wondering what makes us think that like we should be working to help other people do something. And I was, I was wondering what makes us think that those 15 people are any more influential or capable than the 15 people here. And what would it look like to try to come up with an internal path of action that we could act on that would kind of eliminate some of those external um, path deficiencies. And so, uh, yeah, that's kind of what was pinging me. So what, what would it look like if we acted as if we were those 200 people who had responsibility? What if we acted as if we were those 200 people that were gonna be looked back at as those who decided whether they acted or not and what kind of future and legacy we left? Thanks, Jordan. Um, I think we'll have a couple. Uh, I go real Andy, quick, I just want to comment on that. Um, yeah, go ahead and jump in. I, uh, I don't have a lot of information on this. Maybe someone else knows better than I do, but my understanding is that um, Vaslav Havel and the Velvet Revolution, they saw how broken the Soviet system was and they decided to just act as if they were already in a new system. And I love that idea because yeah. that's TAP's imagination. That's, you know, that, like, we're just gonna act as if it's already here. So let's, let's do that. Thanks, Jordan, for... Oh, can that. I also come in with a quick comment? Yeah, thanks, Ken. Go ahead, Doug. Uh, what people are thinking in most times is the actions to be taken are positive actions. I think that's not where we are. I think the actions that have to be taken are draconian and will be experienced by most people as negative. For example, uh, as of next Monday, it's illegal to produce any gas driven cars, period. Uh, as of next Monday, here comes a hard one. No airplane travel except to get back home, period. Uh, and it's going to take tough decisions to do that, and followers will not emerge quickly. Yeah, can I just jump in here real quickly? Uh, <clears throat> Doug, you look at the record of how effectively we've dealt with COVID. Um, where the evidence, you know, despite the disagreements, the evidence is fairly clear that things work and things don't work, and we're now in backslide again. What? How do we get? How do we get the confidence, and how do we generate the focus? to be able to drive unpopular decisions. That's what I think that those CEOs nudged by their middle managers would say. They basically have to be saying, our organization must stop if we are to deal with climate change. Okay. But you've, got, you've got 100 companies that are responsible for 70% of global emissions. It's not whether I get on a plane or not. Although I mean, that matters, but you know, how do you get those hundred companies to move given that they have shareholders? Because we have to say what they're going to move on. They've got to move on things like cutting airplane travel. Let's go to, Can, Eric, let's go to Eric and Pete. <laughs> it's hard. Uh, 
Okay, I, I need it just a one breath before I can recover myself. <laughs> the conversation is getting dense for me. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, in, it, all these strategies is really difficult because they all make sense, but they all don't make sense. And for me, that all, a certain moment, my mind breaks, um, as you know me. Uh, <laughs> And um, one part is um, in um, this book, uh, IFS Innovations and Elaborations. There's two chapters and I just wanna name the titles, Dealing with Racism, Should We Exercise or Embrace or Inner Bigots? So one fundamental question is, do you shame someone or do you motivate them to change and, and be present and be compassionate? The system of IFS is mostly the compassionate way. But sometimes the compassionate way is the best, I think, and sometimes there's hard ways and hard roads you have to take. But the ex and in terms of psychology, the other chapter is called perpetrator parts. There they talk about um, the founder, uh, Richard Schwartz, he worked with um, people who were abusers, sexual, physical, and it's a very uncomfortable subject. He was compassionate to people who are perpetrators and he, he was able to reach them. It's not that everybody can reach, be reached that way, but some people got reached and healed their own per perpetrator parts. And there's something in this whole psychology with how we deal with everything. And it, it says the first chapter that I read is our inner bigots. Like there's a lot of, complacency in ourselves that maybe mirrors the complacency of those leaders in those organizations and it's difficult because we're I don't actually know what the problems are of those organizations when you look at them from their own view is it the shareholders yes could be is it uh, oh it's too complex we don't have the proper systems could also be and then the second level which I might have named in another call is one of the fundamental things that needs to happen is putting value and numbers on uh, and mapping the global value change because that's how you will um, convince those shareholders to change. It's by putting numbers and money and it's also a collaboration between governments there and uh, what's the societal cost of our collapse? Put it in numbers and put it in clear numbers that are being broken down to the smallest details of the whole value chain. Like um, if a farmer doesn't get enough money uh, because the crop uh, in a social way is not produced, uh, that he gets enough uh, money, then he won't be able to be a farmer anymore. And then that farm doesn't become sustainable. And this, that's not a sustainable example, but something about if you map the whole value chain, you can then start to see all the different pieces of the puzzle and how that can change better. And then we can all look at the same picture and see, ah, oh, yeah, that could be changed. It's not that big. It's not extremely complex, but it needs to be there. Uh, I don't know if the, that last part was clear, but um, I'm passionate about it. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Thanks, Eric. Um, Pete? Um, thanks. I, I wanted to um, res respond to Stacy and not because not because I wanted to disagree, um, but because I thought it was um, uh, a, a good lesson. Um, uh, uh, Stacy, you, um, you said something interesting, which is I, I don't know how much we want to engage. I don't know how willing people are to, to actually do the work and and um, uh, and you've, you you made an observation that hey I put out a, a pretty simple ask and didn't get you know any response I just was asking for names of middle managers and you know how hard that can that be um, the the lesson I have from my life um, a lot of it was being a software entrepreneur and having a wonderful product to to sell to people it, it, they were actually wonderful products. Um, uh, it, it took me a long time to, to realize that people just don't 
like adopt your, you know, like grab your wonderful thing, your wonderful idea or your wonderful product and start using it because it's obviously I built it. It's, and I'm built it to be wonderful. Why wouldn't you use it? Um, it took, it took me a lot of working with marketing teams and especially sales teams uh, to understand that getting awareness and interest in people is, is the hard job of product development actually even. Um, and so um, something else I've learned in, in situations like, like this group um, over a long experience in, in email lists and things like that, um, I, I find that broadcast pleas don't usually work. Um, so saying, you know, hey, let's do this wonderful thing that would be pretty easy to do uh, into, the, into the void of the ether of the, the mailing list. Um, sometimes you'll get lucky and people will jump on it and it'll, ex and it'll spin up and be really exciting. And most of the time they just, well, they just fall flat. Um, so what I learned, and this was a really hard thing for me to learn, um, uh, is that if you want to get something done, you pretty much need to reach out to people individually. Grab somebody by the ear, which is a un very uncomfortable thing to do. Grab them by the ear and say, hey, I need you to give Peter Jones a cell phone. Or you need to help me figure out who can, maybe you don't have a cell phone to, to spare, but I need you to help me, right? I know that I'm making you feel uncomfortable. I'm uncomfortable making you feel uncomfortable. None of us, none of us like this, but this is me and you trying to solve a problem, right? Not me and kind of everybody on the main list. It's just you and me. So, so kind of the first lesson for me was when you ask a mailing list to do something, um, it's not going to happen. Um, you, have, you literally have to reach out to individual people. Um, the, the other thing is uh, having started to reach out to individual people, even though I don't like doing that, um, is that there are lots of good reasons people can't honor your request, right? Maybe it make, doesn't make sense to them. Um, maybe they are like 110% full up with their, their BS life, right? And they can't literally move. Like they can talk to you for long enough to like say hi and stuff, but you know, any other thing is going to like tip over their cognitive apple cart and like cause them pain for the rest of the week or the rest of the month, right? You don't know. Maybe they've got, you know, maybe they're super well managed in their life um, and they just can't fit you into, you know, their, their calendar jingle, whatever, right? The, a hard lesson I learned from watching salespeople do it is you can't let, so when you're grabbing somebody by the ear and, and saying, I need this from you, and they say, well, I'd love to, but I, you know, not today or another time or whatever, you have to kind of honor that. And you have to say, okay, thank you very much. Uh, is it okay if I come back and bug you another time for something else in, in a month or three months or a year or two years or whenever? Um, you have to let, let them be, right? And you have to move on to the next one. And so the hit rate for salespeople for, for cold calls is, you know, like one in 20 or one in 50 or one in 100. And so kind of for me, if I've got to ask for somebody and I've asked one person and they said, yeah, I don't understand it. When I ask the next person, they go, I'm sorry, I don't have time. Or I ask the next person and okay, great, Pete, I'll love, I'll, 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 uh, I'll definitely help you. Just send me an email and they never get back to me or whatever, you know, until I've done 10 or 20 or 30 or 50 of those, I'm not even going to assume that there's something wrong with my request. I'm not even going to assume that the world isn't ready to hear my message. I'm just going to keep plugging away and keep asking people, right? And by the time I get sick and tired of it, then I remind myself, hey, Pete, there are salespeople in the world who do this day in, day out, eight hours a day, calling up people and getting rejected. And so that's when I go, okay, so now I'm halfway done with my cold calls. I'm going to keep doing, or a third of the way done with my cold calls, I'm going to keep doing it again and again and again. Um, and at some point you finally get like, uh, like that when you repetitive injury, when the, the pain goes away, because, <laughs> because you've done it so much, you finally get a callus and you go, okay, I'm going to call another person and, and ask them this favor because, and, and it's not even going to hurt because I've done it so much that, you know, I can't feel anymore. So until you go through that process, I find that you can't, yeah. You can't assume that people aren't listening. You can't assume that, you know, you have to, you have to keep slogging. And that's, I, 
I agree with you. There are a lot of people who are uncomfortable with the work and that's a problem. But another part of the work is just slogging through making the, you know, making the request over and over and over and getting rejected until somebody finally rewards you with a, you know, hey, I can help and, and, and I've got time right now. Let's start working. Thanks. Can I just ask one rhetorical question? And, and Jerry, you're muted, so <laughs> I'm going to take that as a yes. Yes, go ahead. So my, my rhetorical question is, do we want to keep behaving in a way where everything's about sales and what we can sell or buy from people? Because I, I, I hear- I'd, I'd love to take that. Yeah. Um, I, I, I said the word sales. I also said the word marketing. Um, that's partly because I come from a background where those were technical tools that my organization used. Um, uh, you can think of it in different ways, right? Um, you can think of it as a stone, I'm a stone soup I, I, uh, chef, I guess. I could, I was, I went through a stone soup seller. No, that's not right. A stone soup purveyor, yeah, a little bit softer, but not right. A stone soup chef. I'm making stone soup. I need people to know about it. It's just a fact of life. Um, and this is something that I wish we had been taught in school, but it's a fact of life that um, everybody's got their own stuff going on and you need to recruit people to your cause. When you have a cause, people don't automatically flock to your cause. Um, you need to explain it to them, um, which we can use the word marketing for. Um, uh, you need to get the word out, which we can use the word marketing for. You have to do persuasion. You have to do um, negotiation. Um, a good salesperson is actually not somebody who goes out and, and um, with a club and hits people, hits customers over the head and drags them back to the office and you know, makes their, their hand signed on, on the dotted line. A good salesperson is somebody who has a product on the, on the one side and a need on the other side and is matchmaking between those things and negotiating understanding and understanding between the offerer and the acceptor um, uh, so that everybody is happy. That's what sales is and that's what most you know, the, the good salespeople I worked with are that they, they love helping people. So when they're they're and, and they're energized by finding that one person out of 10 or that one person out of 50 that needs their help, that needs the product. And they're not going to bug a bunch of people to do that. They're not going to. So it's a fault when we think sales or maybe it's not. It, it's a, a, a fault of capitalism that sales has become a, a bad word. But I've, I've got a story from um, my favorite uh, educational institution, Sudbury Valley School. Um, I never went to Sudbury Valley School. I've never been there. Um, I've just read about it. I homeschooled my kids, so I know a little bit about how kids are excited and, and willing to learn and stuff like that. It's, and this is a, a, this is a story that happens over and over and over and over in Sudbury Valley School. Uh, Sudbury Valley is a place where there's not really a difference between teachers and, and students. Um, there are some adults around to kind of make sure that people have uh, questions. If people have questions, they can answer questions. Um, everybody gets a democratic vote. There's a, a town council, a, a school council once a week or something like that, where they decide the, the issues of the day. You know, somebody uh, what, did something stupid and, and should they get punished or not, yada, yada, right? Uh, somebody, we're not, we're not taking care of the toilets. They're not getting clean enough. Who's going to do that? So the, 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 in that environment, um, uh, I'll, I'll post a link to the long essay that I'm thinking of. Somebody told the story that it, there was a question. What about, what if you need to learn a really specific skill, like speaking French or something like that? So the, the writer of the essay goes, well, here's how it worked. Um, my friend one day decided that she wanted to learn French. She talked to me and I said, yeah, that would be kind of cool. I would like to know a little bit of another language. So we talked to some of our other friends and pretty soon we had a group of people who were all interested in learning French. So we went to one of the, the, one of the teachers. They're not really teachers. They're adults who happen to be in the mix. We went to one of the, the teachers and said, hey, we think you know some French. Could you teach us some French words? So they set up a little class system um, of, of teaching, you know, uh, teaching enough French. 
that the, the adult was able to find the more materials and more books. And pretty soon they eclipsed that teacher. They were like gung ho about, about French. So then they had to set up something where they got to hire an external expert, um, you know, somebody who knew more French and could teach them more about French. So that, that happens over and over and over at a place like Sudbury Valley because that's what humans do. Humans in life, and this is the only way that anything ever gets done. Humans in life convince each other to do things. Hey, I'm, I'm building stone soup. Do you want to help me build stone soup? And if somebody says no, you know, but it's a sales process. It's essentially a sales process of convincing and negotiating somebody uh, into an agreement of the, with a project that you're doing. Um, and that's the way projects get done. So, so maybe recruiting is a better way, a, a softer word to say than sales, but I, in my mind, they're kind of the same thing. Um, and there's more we could go into on that <clears throat> in lots of different ways. Um, I'm not sure that when you invite somebody to come do something and then go do it with them, I don't think that's a sales process or a marketing job. It's like a, hey, uh, let's go do this thing. And then suddenly they've tried something new and, and changed their minds. Um, I think that's maybe, very maybe recruiting. Recruiting reminds me too much of S, but I like recruiting a lot. So I apologize for my capitalist language. Um, I do not mean the capitalist uh, overlord bullshit. Um, <laughs> I mean simple processes of human negotiation and uh, collaboration. And collaboration. To use, to use another uh, a set of jargon from another another group of folks. And Stacy in the chat says she prefers recruiting or enrolling to selling as well. <laughs> Um, John, you've been really patient. Um, I also wanted to be in the queue. Jordan, I don't know if you intentionally moved yourself behind John, but uh, let's do some mix of John, Jordan, and me. Okay, coming to you from a diner in Gilroy, so there might be some Excellent. background noise. Are, are, you um, eating, are you eating garlic? I had, not, not garlic, but I had a great uh, breakfast and I've okay, got to con continue my journey. Um, first of all, I have a couple of phones. Uh, I have an Android you know, it's maybe three years old. I have a couple of pre-smartphones. Anybody who needs them for any cause, contact me. I'll give them to you. Um, <clears throat> secondly, I think probably at least half of you, maybe all of you, are either familiar with or you've read uh, Ministry of the Future or Ministry for the Future. Uh, I wouldn't say that it is a, it's not great literature. You know, I mean, it's, it's a great contribution. To, the, to our conversation. It's not great literature, but that's, that's a minor point. You know, it's, that's what, what he's trying to do. It's like this conversation. You know, you're not, we're not trying to be poetic. Maybe Eric is, and maybe he will be, you know, on occasion he is, but we're mostly trying to move the ball, you know, forward, get, get us into survival. Um, I, I reference uh, Ministry for the Future because he kind of in a stealthy way outlines a range of options that were under discussion here. Uh, his, his main character engages in sales, you know, as, as Pete defines it, you know, broadly he engages in negotiation, engages in collaboration. And it's interesting that he makes, he makes a reference to a darker process, but he doesn't go into it in detail. And it's, it's a writer trick. It's, I mean, I think he does, I think he does that part actually pretty well. I don't, you know, he alludes to the fact that the Ministry of the Future has a black ops. And then he later on says, he describes various black ops. And by a black op, I mean, you know, it, it would be somebody executing Doug's plan of no planes by, by such and such day, or no fishing. You know, fishing is really a problem, especially commercial, you know, especially these giant, giant boats. And so he sets up a situation where instead of a Greenpeace boat, pulling you over an armed you know crew pulls over a fishing boat takes off all the enslaved um people who are working on the boat sets them free says to the guys who are running the boat and own it um okay you're adrift you know basically like leaves them on the boat but without means to really um i think they take all the diesel fuel out of the i don't know what they do but basically like it's almost like they're saying you know we're not exactly killing you, but we're, we're putting you at risk because you violated uh, the understanding. I'm certainly not gonna, you know, <clears throat> I mean, I think he did an interesting job of, of presenting to us as readers, a set of realistically tough 
possibilities and trade-offs. Um, some people would say, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing Doug would say, and, and I'd have to agree, he's a little optimistic in that there's this vague coming together, you know, that happens over the 25 years. And by the end, there's great animal habitats. You know, the, the parks have all been listed. The bad agricultural land has been rewilded. It's under indigenous control. I mean, I'd love to see all those things. Those are great. <clears throat> we, we could say it's a little optimistic. Um, but anyhow, it, it's a, I think it's a, it's a point of departure. You know, you should, if, if you want to try to construct your own version that's somewhere between the no flying as of Monday and um, I'm going to eat less meat. You know, I mean, there's a huge territory there, you know, and, and uh, uh, Kim Stanley Robinson has give us a, given us a, a deliberately impressionistic, deliberately incomplete model to start thinking about that and, and push forward. Um, I, I agree with Pete's uh, refinement of what sales and, and uh, recruitment are. I think that's great. Uh, I mean, we all got we got to be doing something like that. And I agree with the, I don't know that, you know, I try to think of the, where, where are the middle managers, you know, that I know. And, and the problem is, if I tell me if this is true for you, but I just have this feeling that the kind of people we are, we're like uh, sense makers, knowledge workers. We, we're doing, we're self, self motivated. We're a little bit out of the mainstream. You know, I mean, if, you know, Ken's got real consulting clients. I only have non, I only have pro bono and nonprofit clients at this point. I don't know middle managers, but I think it's great to go looking for that and to not not be locked into, do they, should they be middle? Can they not be at the top or do they have to be at the top? Don't, don't do it that way. You know, think about where, where is there somebody we can, you know, turn like this guy who just pumped this billionaire uh, who just pumped uh, money into candidates for uh, pandemic prevention. Sam, you, you, you can look him up. You know, I don't know that he's, reachable but i mean the guys you know he gets a whim it's a good good idea let's let's prevent pandemics he writes a couple of million dollar checks this is somebody who should be talked to you know because there's much more efficient ways to i think to do what he's trying to do and uh, i think some of us here and in other parallel groups that we belong to have some better ideas that we could we could communicate with him so thank you and uh i, I really enjoyed the discussion and Thank I'm going to God. continue my journey. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, Jordan, then me. I wanted to uh, answer Stacy's difficult question just briefly. Um, I'll just take maybe two minutes um, and then we can move on or talk more about it. But um, as an infrastructure builder, you, you end up with, a, with an intention and a program of action and a critical path. And there's like a lot of things that could be done that are all good things to do, but there's, you know, you might have a thousand activities that's available to you. So the big question is what, who's working on what and why? And there's this idea or principle that um, of a critical path, like a logical sequence of events that you can kind of progress down. And so one of the things that, that keeps me from responding to two things is that there's so many good ideas but if they're not part of some kind of a logical sequence of events, then they kind of, they can pull a whole group of people's attention towards something. And it, and it might be a great idea. It might not be the right time or sequence. Like it, you, it, so if we wanted to create a network of middle managers, for instance, it, it's like there could be a discussion of how can we do that? How do we contextualize that? What would the basic infrastructure and support be to have lots of those groups functioning? What's the invitation? How do we connect them up to the other things that are moving in parallel? And then there's like a time when that goes out that it's like, okay, the next thing we need to do is connect up middle managers and we could probably go find them. And so for, for me, that's like a really critical thing is, is if I hope if I called, you know, Ken or Hank or Gil or someone and I said, okay, hey, we all kind of agreed on this quarterly plan of action. We need to accomplish these three or four objectives. And hey, Gil, um, can you please make an intro to this person because that'll accomplish this goal that'll, that'll move us along the path we agreed to. That's another way that maybe makes those invitations a lot more compelling. So um, just for whatever it's worth, there's, there's a lot of business people and stuff in my sphere that are like, okay, I'm, I'm happy to help, 
but I need like a really efficient way to plug in and move something forward. So that's part of what I, I hope we can kind of develop together over the, the coming six weeks is a little better sense of that. Thanks, Jordan. Um, let me put a couple of things in the conversation. I just made my notes and pasted them in the chat. So number one, <clears throat> we are not sense making very effectively here. We're busy pointing to a bunch of things that not enough of us have read or digested. Saul Griffith is really, really smart. Um, I'm, I've shaken his hand once. He's put out a bunch of things we don't have at hand a handy digest of what the hell he said and how it fits. Vaclav Smil is really smart, wrote a great article. We don't have a, really a useful synopsis of the measures and so forth, nor do we have the juxtaposition of how are these two interesting approaches toward the future different and similar? Where are the overlaps? Never mind 15 other really interesting thinkers on the topic. So we're not working from a blackboard or a scaffolding of how these ideas fit, which ones might work, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I find that very frustrating. And I can't slow myself down enough to do that systematically in some useful and interesting way. I do that one off when I read a great piece, I put the word excellent at the end of it on a thought in my brain. I debrief into my brain all the different pieces of it and I hope I make it back there. And I know that if I keep doing this over and over again, some of those sub points will connect up because other people said them too. And that is a force I'm counting on over time that the good ideals will sort of bubble out of this work of trying to compost uh, sort of at the, at, the, at the article or nugget place. But, but we're not working from a shared memory really of any kind. So we throw in a bunch of things that are important and useful. Um, and this last piece about the billionaire who funded, I went and looked at the headline, he, he funded a, an effective altruist candidate who then lost big time apparently. But effective altruism is a movement that says, hey, we want to do good in the world, but we want it actually to be effective. So they're trying to figure out, and I don't know using what methods, hey, which of these different things might actually pay out? Why don't we put our energy behind this one instead of that one? Because that one just actually doesn't pencil out. And we, I don't know that we have any effective altruists in the group here, um, but it's a very interesting approach to try to rationalize giving because it came out of philanthropy where a lot of people realized that philanthropy was deeply broken. And I believe that philanthropy is extremely broken. Um, and they were trying to figure out how to, what, they'd come into some money, how do we actually spend this properly? So I think there's a whole, whole bunch of pieces uh, uh, around that. Um, how do we slow things down enough to shine our bright little laser on some of these issues at a time, melt them into the public sphere so that they're useful and reusable, and then replicate the beam, the laser beam, uh, which we're sort of calling composting or mapping or whatever else in our many conversations here in OGM and across the flotilla of entities that are near each other. Um, and, and Jordan, in the meta project, wouldn't it be great if there was some uh, way of, of discerning what those next insights and projects are that put them on the map well collectively? Like right now in, in, in meta, I'm sensing a process, but not a method. Like, 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 like we need to figure out What's the thing to work on and what do we bring to it and all those kinds of things. We're busy, we're busy sort of, we're, we're like blind people, we're like people in a, in, a dark, in a dark room trying to find like the creatures in the room and, and not having uh, the easiest time of it. Um, so, so one playful thought is what if effective altruism were a religion? Uh, and a, and a, and a, or a social movement, what, as opposed to some rational way to, to offer mere philanthropy. Um, how do we, and, and then one last thought, in the middle of all of our conversations, I'm always having this overly idealistic thought that somewhere in the middle of what we're putting on the table lie a couple of subtle things that will actually shift belief systems radically. And a and hundred years from now, the conventional wisdom will include a few things that we've talked about in this conversation that one, that, that, that some, you know, one of those things actually worked and we managed to sort things out because of the, that and a couple other combined uh, topics. It's a little bit like the history of industrialization and capitalism where a couple ideas and a couple people's essays sort of had a, a, an overly large effect and brought us into the world that we're living in, marinating in today that's causing the crises that we're busy sitting here trying to solve. So uh, how can we be a little bit maybe more rational and, and methodical about 
uh, all these nuggets of, of wisdom that we're, we're busy sharing, but not really sharing. Um, how does that actually, how can we move that forward more effectively? And it's kind of a plea to the community, I guess. Uh, Doug, then Eric, and then we're going to be out of time. So I think people are still talking about uh, doing good and finding a better way. I think the logic is wrong. In order to stop CO2 production into the atmosphere, we have to stop major economic activity. That's going to cause a lot of pain and a lot of, for example, unemployment with cascading effects. So I think along with stopping things, we need a new welfare system that really guarantees taking care of people who are displaced by the process. Uh, that's going to be a huge uh, shift in the culture. Anyway, that's my thoughts. Thanks, Doug. Um, go ahead, Eric. Um, I'm going to try to make this simple. Um, so that the way I look at what we need is um, kind of a multi-leveled or all, no, let's say all leveled approach to this kind of mapping. Uh, and uh, I, we need a system that's at the same time as simple as possible, but also very flexible. And it's not really that difficult, but somehow I also cannot get it across somehow. It's close to what Vincent is doing, but somehow it needs any issue that's complex has, has a myriad of facets to it. And to really get close to doing what we want to do and what, uh, what you're talking about, we need a system also that holds it, holds all of it. And, the, and this, how to say that? I also wonder how to, how to talk about this because all these meetings that I'm in, I get a brief moment to talk about it. In single meetings, I sometimes can get it across, but it's still just a fragment of it. And I, I basically said, give me 300,000 euros, uh, I think a year ago. And I've been thinking about getting money for so long already. But somehow I'm also searching for a more fundamental process of how to talk to each other so I can really advance my project and get across what is there properly. Um, I've had moments where I've been able to explain a part of it, but I also want a kind of patience, but also safety. Like if I talk it, at it to one person, they might understand it, but then the, other, the rest doesn't. And what's this, what is it? What is the format of sharing the depth of what I've understood, something like that. Um, thanks, Eric. I, I, and you're not done, but I, I just wish we could sit you down with some college students who are looking for a thesis and have them help you express all the stuff in your head in ways that, that make you happy, right? Because um, I feel like I love, I have so much agreement with what you say, and then you you almost always hit a spot where it's like ah oh, that didn't that didn't actually fit or that that that's not working and I I'm like how do we how do we get you past that and how do we get it out and set so that you can point to it and go look over here and here's my offer. Yeah. Um, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, and and if we could create a functional method system process group like that. That's useful everywhere. That's, you know, there's a whole bunch of students in the world looking for projects to do. If we could turn them toward fruitful projects in their neighborhoods with their, with their neighbors, that's a great thing. Um, building sort of a, a common bed of wisdom. Um, so I'm just reading Jordan's note in the chat. Uh, for me, Pete Gill and others, would it be helpful for me to propose the concrete system process way I see this could work to resolve the concerns we have expressed here? I don't want it to feel too heavy, but I think we collectively know approximately how to do this. I might've held back too much in the last cycle to allow for emergence. Um, in the last cycle of conversation here or in the last major cycle of all of our conversations, what do you mean, Jordan? To, to, to the last couple of years and the last six weeks, um, it, it's like, it, 
I think we have enough skills in the in the room between all of our various disciplines, but there's there's a very basic framework that like humans have worked out over thousands of years how you organize these diverse networked groups to deliver a shared goal. And it and it's like very well tested and proven. Um, and it's it's the basics of of lean and integrated program delivery and all those all those things, just how you bring together diverse networks of people to accomplish something that none of us can accomplish in isolation. My concern's been it, it's like I don't want to crush the emergence in the group or or like it feel too heavy. So um I guess that's what I'm trying to express, but it but it's kind of like at the same time I can see us spinning and a little frustrated. So I'm wondering if I should try to take the time to articulate that and at least get something on the table that everybody could beat up and um, um, so prove. From my own perspective, Jordan, um, if you were to point me toward a project management system that included a couple other people's project ideas or nugget sized tasks that need to be done and the dashboard where I could look and pick through things and say, hey, Jerry, would you list four things in this, in, in this particular system? I would go list four things in the system. I think I understand where you're pointing, Jordan, and I, 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 I'm just missing the system. I just want to see the system beginning to work on the smallest bite-sized piece of what could well, the simplest thing that could possibly be done. And then I'll contribute four nibbles to it and somebody else will put turnips in. And then Stacy will bring like, like some jambalaya and like chuck it in. But I, I don't know yeah. that you okay. like perfect. jambalaya at all, but, but I'm, 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 I'm wanting to see the artifact. Okay, perfect. Thanks, yeah. Jerry. Um, Gil, you may have the last word here. Yeah, okay. Um, I think what Jordan is proposing is not just a system, but an approach. And he's, you know, he's, he's, he's offering to make an offer to us. And, and Jordan, I encourage you to make an offer and not worry about crushing the process because we can always say no or no thank you or yes, but different. Or as Jerry did say, yeah, but for that to work, I need this. Uh, yeah. Framework, you know, I, I've been I've been flogging the, the notion of requests and promises, requests and offers in the chat before. And I think that's core to what we're doing here. You know, we're talking about stuff and we're sharing our opinions about stuff and what we want and what we care about, but it comes down to making offers to each other and making requests of each other, which goes back to Doug's original starting point. You know, go to, go to these middle managers and offer them something and ask them to do something. And that kind of concretization, I don't think crushes the process. I think it moves the process forward. Uh, and it's been a great conversation this morning. Thank you. Let's go. Yeah, um, great conversation this morning. Thanks, Jerry, for hosting. Yeah, thank you all for, for being here. It's a hard conversation because I think there's, there's a latent, there's a, a, there's a shadow of frustration behind us a lot because we're deep in a series of crises. We've been talking a lot for a couple of years now and most of us would like to be doing more than talking with one another. I think we really, I, I love you all. I think you're, I, I, I love our calls. I love where we go. Um, and I would like to be pulling on a rope together with you rather than saying, you know, twine is actually, hemp is more sustainable than plastic for that rope. And uh, if we braid it like five times instead of 12 times, it's gonna work better. That, 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 like we're, if we don't, if we don't act quickly, we don't get any place. And then also, I think there needs to be a smorgasbord of paths in. Um, Doug, um, I can see you in a in a black beret with face paint, like uh, leading an insurgency to try to shut down the major corporations that are polluting. But I can also see this gigantic uh, immune system called capitalism that will not allow large industries to merely be to simply be shut down. There, there there's like all sorts of all sorts of immunity built baked into the system that um, I don't know how to get out and and maybe we can crowdsource buyout offers for the critical so so let's pretend we're looking at uh, Shell Oil or Exxon or Chevron God Chevron um, uh, why don't we figure out who are the essential staff at Chevron and off give them lifetime buyout offers crowdsource buyout offers for the staff that are irreplaceable at Chevron without whom Chevron can't function, offer those people a better life somewhere else. But I'm just saying, is there, is there, is there a productive, creative, funky, different way to cause the collapse of some of these industries that, that uh, might actually work? I don't know, uh, but, but, I, but I think that just asking them to shut down 
ain't, ain't, ain't gonna happen. There's too many people's money basically piled into these things and uh, uh, profiting from the actions. But I'm, I'm completely, I'm personally very open to clever alternate strategies to try to achieve the larger aims, the larger goals. And Greta Thunberg has spent a lot of time and, and, and energy and sweat trying to say, the house is on fire, we need to act as if the house is on fire, um, which is great. And then we began this conversation with act as if the new system exists, quoting uh, Václav Havel, which I love. I love behaving as if the new system exists. And to me, that means standing up the systems that allow us to come together to do the kinds of things we need to do. Um, Hank, thank you for, for being here. And we're just about to, to wrap. Anybody else want to put a bow on this, offer something else? We're good. Thank you all very much. Can we go out with a poem? Uh, Ken, we didn't hear what you just said. I think you're on local news. There we go. Now we hear you. Can we go out with a poem? Oh, yes, please. So this is a poem that um, I think is about midlife for, for individuals, but I also think it's very appropriate for the time. It's by um, Rilke. And it's called The Winged Energy of Delight. Just as the winged energy of delight carried you over many chasms early on, now raise high the daringly imagined arch holding up the astounding bridges. Miracle does not become miracle in the clear light of achievement that is earned in the world. Miracle becomes, no, miracle does not lie only in the amazing living through and defeat of danger. Miracle becomes miracle in the clear light of achievement that is earned in the world. Let me see, I have, haven't recited this for a while. Um, Working with things is not hubris when building associations beyond words for the pattern becomes denser and denser and being carried along is no longer enough. So take your well-disciplined strengths and stretch them between two opposing poles because inside the human heart is where God live, where God learns. Would you like me to read the text? Yeah, I'm doing it from uh, memory. It's been which a while. Is in, which is really impressive, and I like it a, okay. I like it a ton. Pardon? I just said pretty damn good from memory. Yeah, exactly. So here, as once the winged energy of delight by Reiner Maria Rilke, as once the winged energy of delight carried you over childhood's dark abysses, now beyond your own life, build the great arch of unimagined bridges. Wonders happen if we can succeed in passing through the harshest danger but only in a bright and purely granted achievement can we realize the wonder. To work with things in the indescribable relationship is not too hard for us. The pattern grows more intricate and subtle and being swept along is not enough. Take your practiced powers and stretch them out until they span the chasm between two contradictions for the God wants to know himself in you. I think that's a different interpretation, but the one I, I did was from Robert Bly, but I, that's also a very good one. So there's, you. you know, and the original would be in German. So it would, um, which I uh, cannot recite from memory or even if I had it in front of me. So uh, perfect. And um, I think you're totally right. I think the other translation is closer to what you just recited. Um, thank you. It's a beautiful poem. Well, I will, we'll add it. Oh, and, and there's the German. Thanks, Pete. That's great. Um, Ken, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Good to see you all. Yeah. Closing. Bye, all.